You're listening to Comic Reflections, episode 85. I'm your host, Nicholas Prom. And I'm Jeff Barnard. The bizarro Nick. Me <laughs> and Glad. Comics so, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, our first book we're going to talk about today is something very new for us on this show. Yes, and hopefully we did it last time. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've ne- Okay, it's a it's romance okay. comic. It's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I never read a romance comic before. It's My Love. Yes. From Marvel Comics. Um, Mr. Bushima illustrated it. Yeah, let me uh, back up just a little bit. We've never talked about romance comics on this show, but I love them. <laughs> They're fun. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I buy, I've said before, I, I, the books we talk about on the show are coverless return copies that I buy in bulk on eBay. And I used to just kind of like skim out all the stuff that was non-superhero or whatever, or that wasn't Conan. But <laughs> um, I came, I started reading, like I came across actually some Charlton romance comics. They were career girl romances, and every story was a girl with a job, like leaving anyway, giving up her career for her man. Mm-hmm. It's really wow, really progressive stuff. But um, but I got into reading romance comics from that. Mm-hmm. And once, you know, got him further on the show, I was like, hey, you know, let's do more genres than just superheroes. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to reintegrate this. So, so yes, it's our first and not our last romance book okay. that we'll talk about. But we'll, they'll be sprinkled mm-hmm. in here and there. It's not going to, we'll, we won't do all romance episodes. Mm-hmm. So, but yes, it's uh, My Love, number 37, from Marvel Comics. And the lead story is, did I make the wrong choice? Reprinted from My Love, number 7. Um, written by Stan Lee, with beautiful art, uh, penciled by John Buscema uh, of Conan, Thor, and Fantastic Four fame, uh, and inked by Dick Ayers, who was just one of the greats. So also. It says embellisher. Is that another word for inker? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Because the penciler, okay, you, they pencils, do, they do the that. pencils, hmm. but the embellisher not only darkens the pencils, but also adds their sh- touches of shading or different elements. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the inker is, is as important as the penciler, oftentimes. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, the subtitle for My Love is Tales of Love That Could Be Yours. <sighs> In every girl's life, including yours, this question must arise. Did I make the wrong choice? So, oh, okay. So we start our, start our story starts with Valerie Van Deen or Van Dyne uh, of the Social Register. She's a uh, she's uh, a party girl, um, and she's bored. Party, party. Yeah, and she's bored with her country club lifestyle. You know. Yeah. Mm, I like to be bored. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Oh, the idle rich—they have it so rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see. She um. Um, she's throwing a party and she's bored with the shallow people that's in her party. So, I don't know, she decides to let's do something wild and crazy. Let's do, let's get piano lessons. <laughs> ah, yeah. <that's, laughs> uh. So she takes piano lessons from this hunky guy who doesn't have any money. Right. Right. And, um, and I gotta he say, falls in love with her, she falls in love with him, but not at, well, at first, but they both do not say that until right. much later. Huh? Gotta have some tension in the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they... And I guess they start kissing and all that Aki stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a kissing book? Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no, she, she goes back. Will you be the Columbo from... of this show? The... What's that? Peter Falk. Yeah. Okay, remember the movie of Princess Bride that I just read? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. Okay, alright. It's not that bad. <laughs> well, she goes back to her rich girlfriends, and they really think that he, you know, it's a bad idea. He's a nobody, one of them says. Oh, um. He's a somebody to her. Yeah. So they get married, and then she, after she gets married, she starts having second thoughts. See the right guy. And so she tells him this as well. We're going to drive by the old um, country club, and she sees the guys and girls there really looking bored and stupid. So um, 
Larry is the boy's name. Right. He looks like Bobby Goldsboro a little bit. Okay, I'm not sure I know who that is, but... Oh, it's a teen throb in the early 70s. Okay. I know at last, the only time a girl can make the wrong choice is when she doesn't marry the man she loves. Oh, man. Oh, That's I... profound, sort of. Yeah, um... And I have to say, John Buscema's romance art is just as good as his Conan stuff. It's just we're not seeing him, like, anybody get their head cut off. <laughs> you know, that's the big difference. <laughs> when I was reading this, I said, man, wouldn't it be great if Hulk showed up? <laughs> right? <laughs> Bar. <laughs> <laughs> Marry him. Bar. <laughs> Hulk, <laughs> Hulk mad at the romantic tangle. Oh, <laughs> man. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the first of a couple backup stories in this is Don't Ever Leave Me, reprinted from Lovers, number 77. And this is... Um, this is some 50s stuff that's being mm -hmm. reprinted, and it's really beautiful art by uh, J. Scott Pike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her name, uh, Rita, is is, married, is in love with this boy who's working all the time. And Rita has red hair, so it must be take off on Rita Hayworth, who was oh, yeah. absolutely beautiful, married Orson Welles. That didn't last, did it? No, I guess not. Now, they made a good movie, so... Sure. Um... Oh, which movie is that? Oh, um... Is it A Touch of Evil? No. Okay. It is, um... I only know a couple of his movies, so I'm, I'm afraid. I'm crying out loud. I'll think about it later, but it's got a great scene, and I've talked about it on the show before, where oh, okay. he's shooting mirrors. They're in a mirror. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, that's Shanghai, right. Shanghai, um, let's see, some, some like... I don't know, but... Uh, okay. What are you going to say? Uh, I think you, when we were talking about some kung fu stuff and the Bruce Lee scene in, uh or the scene in End of the Dragon, when mm -hmm. he's got the mirrors and breaking all the mirrors. That's probably where you reference that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so what's going on with Rita and who else? Or? Oh, what's his name? His name is... Um, oh, I guess it, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter <laughs> so that much. Really, but yeah. Yeah, and he works really hard, and he's trying to make enough money so they can get married. And he's, he's kind of ignoring her kind of we're well, not ignoring her but doesn't have time for her they make dates and he can't even make it yeah and so her boss is you know, a handsome witch dude he's got a mustache so you know he's up to no good right uh he's he's trying to get in on the action right and she rebuffs him but kind of starts to cave a bit um because mm -hmm. this guy's paying attention he's got time for her yeah so she's trying to call him and Art. Art doesn't answer the phone, so she just gives up and runs into the park where they meet all the time. And then she's in despair, and then Art comes and says, Hey, Rita, I try to get in touch with you. I got a great new job, and everything's going to be great. Let's get married. Oh, um, you know, this is life before cell phones. Right. Beautiful art on this story. I mean... There's a there's a formula to these, and they're mm -hmm. not like amazing earth-shattering stories, but um, they do resonate, you know, with like feelings and experiences mm -hmm. that you, ha you do have. They're true to life, and um, yeah, and it's a and decent moral. I mean, yeah. don't give up somebody. Hey, he's trying to make a good living so he can support you. I mean, yeah, the first one was that you know follow your heart. Although sometimes that's a bad idea, but it's. Not yeah. an evil one, but a... right. And uh, you know, the I mean, I think these are valuable because, again, these stories they say may seem light, but they do have a, a an emotional resonance to them. Mm -hmm. And the art is beautiful. Yeah. Um, and you know, romance comics were at one time a huge genre in comics, and then they shrunk down to nothing and disappeared in the seventies. Um, never to the, return, uh, really. I wonder if yeah, I wonder if the the teenage um, magazine, girl yeah. magazine, seventeen, and all that took yeah. over from it. Um, it's a distinct possibility, but also you have to remember, like you know, the golden age of comics. Like, wow, this is a huge market mm -hmm. marketplace because it's before television, right? And you know, you had radio and comics, and yeah, you'd go to the movies every mm -hmm. week, but as a television has this mass visual medium in your home every night, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. became an increasing thing. The comics market shrunk, and comics are very cinematic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, 
And this is why you'll see the market, comics market continue to shrink over the decades because all of the other forms of media and entertainment mm -hmm. um, that have crowded it out. Um, yeah, the same thing with movies as well. Uh, hit uh, TV hit movies really bad, and uh, now the internet's hitting movies, and I guess internet's hitting comics as well. It's, yeah, um, hmm. but in a strange way, movies are uh, giving comic books a renewed life because people mm -hmm. go see the movie and they get interested. It may be in digital comics, or they may want to go and get print stuff to hold in their hand, mm -hmm. uh, which I swear by. You know, I'll never pay for something I can't hold in my hand. That's yeah. you know, that's the digital comics to me are the emperor's new clothes. Mm -hmm. um, although there are some interesting things you can do with them. They kind of do the panel to panel like scrolling. That's kind of neat. Yeah. But um, it'll never take the place of that tactile feel, the smell of old comics on newsprint. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All so, right. This is our final one, I think. For this issue, yeah. Um, and it's called, uh, hang on, Only You For Me. Now, it's art again by J. Scott Pike. No clue who scripted it. But um, this says it's uh, reprinted from uh, also from Lovers Number 77, but that's incorrect. But I couldn't find the actual uh, issue that it is from. Yeah, it's definitely from the 50s. Yeah, yeah. Early 50s. And that's when J. Scott Pike was doing was doing a lot of uh, romance work for, uh, it would have been Atlas at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay, we have uh, Penny, who's going out with um, Tommy. T T um, Penny is a beautiful blonde. Tommy is this nerd, but decent looking, but he's, he's a four-eye, so. Right. And he's got still gray hair, of all things. Isn't that gray to you? Yeah, kind of, but you have to remember... Uh, only have so, so many colors. So. Right, the four-color process, if you want to give a guy like a light, dusty brown hair, um, yeah. it, that's it's a trickier thing. Anytime you're blending on that level, it's kind of... Mm -hmm. That's why superhero comics worked so well in the four-color process, because you have all these bright colors and, mm -hmm. and you know, fantastical situations, you know. Um, so, anyway. Yeah. You never know what... Um, Tommy is studying, although he's studying Latin, but I'm not sure he's going to make any money doing Latin. <laughs> right. Although I would love to know I think Latin. it's some kind of technical engineering, I believe, that he's mm -hmm. studying in this. But yeah. All right. Well, well Penny has this um, Sue. Um, His girlfriend. Uh, yeah. No, Sue is um, her roommate. Oh, excuse me. I think. It yeah. Looks like that. Yeah. And, um, and Sue thinks she's wasting time, and, she, and, and Sue has about seven boyfriends at least one of them is going to propose <laughs> right and uh yeah but she thinks uh, that uh who's the blonde penny penny is wasting her time on tommy because he's a nerd he's a nerd and he's too busy with studying and right he doesn't take her to parties and all that yeah and uh so sue is really superficial yeah she is not a bad looker though <laughs> no all these chicks are gorgeous um yeah um some big shot, uh, some campus big shot uh, tries to ask uh, Penny out, and she refuses him. So, yeah, and he's got a bow tie on. Man. Yeah, man, those are the days. Yeah, but um, but Sue thinks he's a real hunk. This guy's like the captain of the football team or some crap like mm -hmm. that. So, um, oh, the Incredible Hulk does show up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, Twinkie alert. We haven't yeah. had one in a while, but but yeah. The Hulk and the Twins of Evil, so it's Hulk fights the Wendigo and the Abomination of for the love of Twinkies. <laughs> yeah. And Hulk eats a Twinkie. Yeah. Hmm. So. Or a hostess fruit pie, but yeah. Well, same thing. So. Alright. Well, Penny gets stood up, stood up again because Tommy is trying to study so hard. And um, so she's going after um, this other guy, um, the What's his bill? Was uh, um, it BMOC, Big Man on Campus? Yeah, yeah. He tries to kiss her, and and she says no. She turns her head, and uh, then Tommy comes. Hey, late to the party. Says, um, I got the. I don't, I don't know. He got. He, he's going to get the degree now. He's going to get a job, so he gives her a ring. And Sue is really jealous, and. 
And Sue says, and I try to give her advice. Yeah. And I, you know, it, it sounds a little timey and all that, but at that time, it is very important for a girl to get married. Yeah. You don't want, you did not want to live your life by yourself um, as a female. And guys wanted someone to be with, so they didn't have to do house chores was a full-time job at this. I mean, sure. A, and to make a cake took six hours. Sure. You know, or something. You know so, so we're talking about, you know, uh, what we would now think of as outmoded gender roles because they've really shifted or been blurred. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, there was a time, like, boy, if you, you don't, you don't catch a man by the time you're out of college. Boy, you're just an old maid. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, and it's still true. No, oh, no, 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 my no. gosh. <laughs> so, but uh, it was interesting. I would love to actually, I should have let my stepdaughter and wife read this, see what they thought about it. Oh, yeah. They would, I don't know if they'd be amused or not. Um, <laughs> they're not, they're not as bad as I thought they were going to be. They, um, it's generally decent advice for that time and even now. Just because he's a nerd doesn't mean he doesn't love you and will take care of you. And um, that's kind of a good thing to say, yeah. speaking as a nerd. So. Right? So the next book we've got to talk about, um, it's uh, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., number 18. Now, this was the last issue of the series, and the last three issues were all reprints of Nick Fury stories from uh, Tales of Suspense. So the Steranko run had just ended, and then they kind of did this. Mm -hmm. um, but this is some cool stuff. Um, the lead story is um, called Who Strikes at S.H.I.E.L.D. from Strange Tales number 142, uh, written by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, and uh, with art uh, penciled by Jack Kirby and inked by Mike Esposito. And I see in the credits it just says Stan Lee, writer. Yeah, but I looked up online, and it's Kirby plotted it, and Stanley came back with dialogue. That's usually how it would go. Okay. So you gotta take it with a grain of salt when it says written by Stanley, mm -hmm. because the artists in the Marvel style, especially, would tend to plot their own stories, or Stan mm -hmm. would give a you know, give them nuggets of a story, and then the you know the, the artist would really flesh that all out, and Stan comes back and adds dialogue later mm -hmm. so yeah oh so oh, splash panel opens up with this crazy robot yeah it's a kirby bot going crazy and is one of the greatest robots ever i've ever seen although it has legs and rollers on the legs which is hmm but it is super awesome <laughs> yeah it, it doubles as an office chair yeah. uh, <laughs> but it's great <laughs> So it's 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 a new invention at Shield, and it's going haywire because they didn't test it properly, and so uh, Nick Fury's got to take it out. Nick Fury is furious as he <laughs> always is. Oh, and they um, they fix it. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so they're going okay. So they find out they were worried about Mentalo, and this is odd. And I noticed about Marvel comics is that they'll name something and then about 10 years later they'll make fun of the name so right and uh, uh cornball name like that it sounds too funny too but true so tough yeah. be true so however uh, mentalo is uh along with the fixer mm -hmm. uh, are is really the 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 villain of this piece here yeah and they're well, not really oh there was somebody beyond that well let's get into the okay. story and we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. So they're uh, got the three people in the ESP room, right? And all they are they have these black boxes in front of their face. It right. kind of works. Yeah. Man, um, the shield compound is really impressive. Mm-hmm. Now oh, it's Kirby-esque, so so it's awesome. Yeah. Not Kirby-esque. Kirby's doing it. Right. Kirby-esque right. would be like somebody imitating. Kirby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it's Kirbylicious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, it, we need to use that often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Mentalo goes through, uh, he's trying to meet the fixer, and he goes through all these uh, booby traps, and he meets them. And um, the fixer is a technological wizard and yeah. super villain. He invents all kinds of cool weapons and stuff. He is a 
the villainous co um, counterpart to Tony Stark. Sure. And you, later he would uh, have a long-standing uh, association with uh, Baron Zemo. Hmm. The second. Oh. In the, I think, all new Masters of Evil or mm -hmm. whatever. So. Yeah. Oh, we see people getting ready. They're, they're fighting and trying to get... The S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are training. Training to, to fight them. And I don't know, it, it's a sense of doom that they cannot fight them. It's kind of interesting. Is this, there's nothing they can do. Mentala is going to kick their butt, and they're trying to fix it, but no yeah. one thinks they can. It's right. It's an interesting concept. It's a um, good way to set it up because we want, because we've never seen Ment Mentalo, mm -hmm. but, but we've got to be impressed by like his abilities. So this is a good way to set up a story, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Nick Fury versus Intercontinental Phone Hookup. <laughs> it is a vest with these huge uh, headphones. Uh, headphones, and it, it's just amazing. And I have little, uh, that they cannot do anything that my, iFi, my iPhone cannot do. <laughs> right. But it's huge, you know, and it's, it's funny to see, like, the predictors of like the cell phone you're know, like wow you can talk to somebody across the atlantic yeah. on this wireless wow. device that's huge mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> actually it probably isn't wireless even but yeah i don't know um my it looks like it's plugged into something somewhere maybe. but it's pretty wild mm -hmm. you know and it's like this is i so great of all the 60s spy stuff you know yeah. because the bond movies were riding high you had the man from uncle and every comic company has got something with an acronym. Mm -hmm. The Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the Thunder mm -hmm. Agents, and I mean, and there's others. I'm just going to blank on them right now. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's uh, okay. The Fixer's got this really cool vehicle. And it, oh, is it, I don't know. They don't know if they name it, but it's just a cool rocket machine. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty rad. Yeah, and they come against this huge wall that. Um, shield is made so they make a Jericho tube and he yells into this little microphone and destroys the um, shield yeah so pretty neat. So, oh shield shield okay yeah so, oh that's mm -hmm. fun yeah so um, yeah so the fixer and Mentalo seem like a pretty good team of super villainy mm-hmm yeah they are it's pretty impressive so they're coming towards they're going they're going after Nick Fury and Nick Fury has got his guys in a room. So, but the problem is, is that he, um, Mentalo can figure out what they're going to plan. So, and what can you do about that? There's nothing really you can do. And that's the entire problem of this. How do you outsmart somebody who knows what you're thinking? Right. Um, so, that's real tricky. Mm -hmm. So, they're ready for him and... What does he, uh, Mentalo and Fixer, fly over them and blast them? Yeah. But it's the, and the Fixer's got all these great inventions to like fly yeah. around and blow through walls mm -hmm. with stuff and really cool. Yeah, and Shield's got some great stuff too, which is kind of cool. They both had wonderful gizmos. Yeah, and Kirby is the perfect guy to do gizmos. Mm -hmm. And he probably dreamed up every single one of these ideas. I bet none of this technology was Stan's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and Fury is pretty cool because he really doesn't like the stuff. They'll use it, but yeah. he doesn't trust it, and that's kind of a cool... Yeah, well, I mean, look, mm -hmm. we didn't have, like, fancy intercontinental phones in <laughs> World War II, yeah. you know, when I was fighting with the Howlers, mm -hmm. the Howling Commandos, and, uh, and I realized, I was thinking, at this time, uh, you know, I don't think you ever really saw, like, the Howlers die, yeah. except for that one that you were talking about. And Junior died, and... I think somebody else is supposedly dead, too. I think they are all dead, except for Fury, Dum Dum, and Gabriel. Hmm. Because Gabriel, remember, we saw he was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. in that Godzilla comic. Oh. Yeah, okay. I mean, that book was really, Gabriel was, like, front and center. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Yeah, so... so the battle rages between S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, and the cool. Fixer and Mentalo. And, yeah, Mentalo has some, or Fixer uses some kind of device and knocks them down everybody in shield except for fury who's knocked down later and he's put out um of action and they put a sh put a face mask on him to do exactly what he wants to do 
is this uh, now we have here the covers yeah we have a two-page spread that reproduced because this issue is reprinting three stories from strange tales and they're all Nick Fury Asian of shield stories and we have a two-page spread that re reproduces uh, the covers mm -hmm. um, and yeah and they're great and they're curb tastic mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and here's, remember when shield covers had no space for a title <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. because they're so crammed with action. Right. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I actually really don't, except the title is not that necessary, except which, um, when you're trying to reference uh, an issue, really. Right. I mean, it doesn't... Like, I want to know what series it is and what's the number, mm -hmm. you know? So, anyway, the next part of our story is called To Free a Brain Slave. I love and, the font, the little curvy. Oh, it's great. And it's uh, reprinted from uh, Strange Tales, number 143. Uh, written again by uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. And the art, um, the tr it's kind of transitioning. Kirby is doing, still penciling some, but he's uh, he's got help from Howard Purcell on this story. And then Mike Esp Esposito inks again. Mm -hmm. and oh, then, so Demio. Uh, Mickey DeMeo, DeMeo. Is, um, was a pseudonym that Mike Esposito used. Oh, okay. I'm not sure why. Yeah, it's sort of... People use them for different reasons sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen like ones that were or heard of like somebody did everything and they created pseudonyms so it didn't look like you did everything in the whole book. Yeah, although that would be kind of cool though. I, would I mean, some people want that and other people don't, so... Maybe he was like, oh, this is some cheapo thing or something. I yeah. Hmm. I mean, people have all kinds of motivations for doing things because everybody's different. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, so okay. so Fury this is... This is really complicated. Fury is <laughs> now the brain slave of Mentallo mm -hmm. and the Fixer. And he's got this cool mask they've got to put on him to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to enslave him. Not like Iron Man's mask without just gray, but yeah. not like the original, but like right. the newer one. But it's very similar. And then you know, Shield agents are trying to mount a counter attack and rescue Fury and all that stuff. And Dum Dum's in charge. I always like Dum Dum. Yeah. And they got these cool weapons. <laughs> yeah, they do. Oh man. And then test my new. Oh, and we got Tony Stark, and Tony Stark has a heart attack or something. He's really super tired. He's trying to figure out a way to go against Mentallo. Well, because he's not turning into Iron Man in this story, and he's got his chest plate under his business suit, mm -hmm. and he does need to recharge it so he could, because it's keeping him alive. And so he's having some trouble because he's he's been working, you know, mm -hmm. around the clock and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah, um. So he doesn't. You know, he doesn't let the doctor see him because he's wearing his vest, I guess. Yeah. And so the fixer in Mentallo, well, the fixer, I guess, fixes a up a hydrogen bomb. Kind of neat look. And he ties Nick Fury to it. I mean, they take off the mental mask he's got. And then Nick's kind of mad that he's holding a hydrogen bomb. That if it goes up, it's going to destroy a city. Right. Oh. And they're still in the shield compound or whatever, or the mm -hmm. helicarrier or something. So it's going to kill any remaining I, shield agents, sure. right? I think it, I think it's a compound. It's not yeah. the helicarrier. Yeah, I think that comes later. Mm -hmm. So, so um, <laughs> Nick asks for a cigar, <laughs> and Mentallo knows. Oh, I know this is not a fake cigar. So <laughs> right. Then he sings. Um, he starts singing Johnny, a get song. your gun. Yeah. So. so that means they attack. So they sent uh, Shield sends two guys up. So was that a coded message to send to the the Shield's ESP division? I guess so. Okay, and so they're mounting a counterattack against the Fixer and Mentallo. Shield mm -hmm. are. Yeah. So they shoot these um. They shoot these darts and make it. Um, Shield, uh, Mentallo and Fixer are wearing these helmets that prevent anybody from reading their mind because they're. Shield does have ESPers. Right. So they shoot these uh, darts at them, and it makes them susceptible to the ESP. And then the ESP division of Shield goes on them and makes them go crazy. Yeah, it sends like just pure, uh, 
you know, thought blasts of hate or something against and them. Sheer and just, hatred. Mental waves of sheer hatred. But unfortunately, Nick Fury is also being victimized of this. So it's his willpower has to overcome uh, mm -hmm. this this pain and stuff. Right. So, um, hmm. <laughs> man, these are action packed. Let me tell you. Yeah, it's a good reading. So Tony Stark's um, cool ray gun destroys the H bomb. Good. Yeah, it is. Oh, good. Whew. So, so um, and it turns into just to a, a pile of dust. Okay. So, uh, and Fixer and Talo go through a wall, and they try to escape, and, oh, man, this is, <laughs> it, it's a metronome pendulum. It's a like little wagon with a shield on it, and, and the guys... The, the guys, shield guys. The shield guys, and there's a shield on the wagon, right? And there's, you know, there's a, a submachine gun or something. Cool. And they're laying there like a snow sled, and it got a pendulum on it. That yeah, that is weird. And um, it messes there's, up their aim apparently. The bad um, guys aim. Yeah. Well, that's smart. Yeah, but it's just sort of one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. Well, you know, Kirby would come up with, like, really cool gadgets, and some of it would be like, wait, what? You know, like, mm -hmm. and this is one of those, huh, kind of uh, instances. So, but, uh, yeah, um, the shield you know agents. might work. Yeah. They capture uh, the Fixer and Mentallo. Dum Dum socks the Fixer in the face, mm. and it's cool. And sometimes Dum Dum's. Um, mustache is white and sometimes it's red. Uh, it's generally red. I think there was a panel where it was like they forgot to color it in. Mm -hmm. And those mistakes do happen. Interesting. I mean, and that could have been a printing error on the you know the printing press itself. You know, like they forgot to uh, mm -hmm. do the color separation or whatever. Right. But, um, um, so Nick is happy and he chews him out, but he chews him on the way. It's, it's shield buddies that they know he, they did a good job yeah that's kind of i, I kind of like the banter in them oh yeah i mean that's one of the great things about marvel comics banter between characters mm -hmm. dc was just kind of like weren't we swell pals that all get along even you know when superman's talking to like say luther or brainiac it's pretty civil you know mm -hmm. even when luther is cursing superman you know it's yeah yeah and yeah yeah all right so we see a helicopter again and then we uh, we see a jet fly off the helicarrier and is attacked by an egg, which is weird. Mm -hmm. And so the next or the last story in this issue, um, that's the lead into that. And it's the story is the day of the druid from Strange Tales number one forty four. Um, pencils split up again between Jack Kirby and uh, Howard Purcell. Inked again by Mike Esposito, and of course Kirby and Lee wrote it. Yeah. I the, feel like we read before the next part with the Druid. No. No? Mm -mm. Okay. We have read the Druid and he's doing something else. But okay. Maybe it's the next one. Maybe That's we, what we read, I, yeah. That's what I meant. Like oh, next, oh, 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 I see. Not the next story we're going to talk about, right. but like the part following, I think we read I before. think you're correct. Yeah, and I, yeah, so. Let's. Yeah, Let's dig the, into it. the cover is cool. We see the druid, and we see Doctor Strange. And I said, "Oh, Doctor Strange is going to be that." Would be really cool. Nick Fury and Doctor Strange talking. That would be fun. Well, right, and you'd think the druid. Mm -hmm. That would be like it's a mystic thing. That would mm -hmm. be a villain for Doctor Strange to yeah. fight. But no, he's fighting uh, Shield. Yeah. So I think Doctor Strange might be in the magazine, but he's not in the story. Right. I was mildly uh, disappointed. Strange Tales was ten, you know was one of those books where. Oh, there was a lead. Actually, they alternated. The lead feature being uh, Shield and Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, the Day of the Druid. And this guy's got this crazy headdress that you would think looks dorky and dumb, but it, it it's cool. I wish somebody would cosplay like this. I am not that guy. But that right. Would be cool. Um, yeah. I can't. He's got like big, huge horns and. Uh, and like a cape that connects to his wrists and his back and the helmet. Mm -hmm. It's he, it's pretty his, wild. His upper of his upper half of his body is naked, and he's got this big um, diamond shaped thing in front of him. And I don't know if there was 
pants, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They're yeah. weird overhauls. Mm -hmm. But um, but you know, the cape is in its weird way. It's kind of like to be like a druid's robe, like it could wrap around mm -hmm. him, I guess. But um, but yeah, anyway, the druid he's he's gunning for shield. And right. Nick Fury. And he brings up the face of Nick Fury in smoke. Yeah, like he's casting spells or something. Yeah. So supposedly the thing about the druid is magic and technology at the same time. Right. So, and he's kind of a jerk. So he <laughs> makes this egg of Satan. Is <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, egg of Satan. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, they so you know it's bad. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. They, they knock down the airplane. The airplane is nuclear powered, which was a real idea. And the, the problem with nuclear powered aircraft is aircraft fall out of the sky for other reasons other than the engine being bad. Well, right. And you don't want a nuclear powered aircraft to crash and have like an atomic explosion somewhere. Yeah. Um, the military has had good luck with nuclear power. There's never been really a problem in any U.S. Navy um, nuclear submarines. That we know about. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, when, when I try not to get too heavy on the conspiracy crap, but, you know, they have the the clout to cover things up sometimes. So Yeah, but when you got got 100 people in the ship, Yeah. I mean, someone's going to say, hey, they never came back from this tour. And, you know, it's, it's hard. Conspiracy theories... The problem is, if more than a couple people know it's a conspiracy, then it's not a conspiracy. So. Right. I mean, people conspire, but I mm -hmm. think the whole cult of conspiracy theories and, like, there's secret stuff that's ruling the world, I'm like, shut up. You know, like, that, that's that's crap. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't, I can't really get into that kind of fantasy lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a real life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can make me fun. I used to be into them. But I mean, it's interesting, yeah. but if you yeah. really take stock in it, Mm -hmm. You're like, right. um, it's like, dude, you need a girlfriend. Right. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. The Soviet Navy had problems. There is a joke. How can you tell if someone is in the um, Northern Fleet sub sub force? They glow in the dark, <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of yeah. Tommy we... Rickover made a nuclear navy, and he said he got more radiation one day in a Russian submarine than he had in the rest of his life. Wow. And so and it's just very bad. You know, um, you know there have been a couple times in history that we've, well, in the last hundred years, that we've almost had nuclear wars. You know, people always talk about, you know, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but there was a, a, it almost happened in the early 80s. Right. So also with the, uh, excuse me, Russian uh, nuclear subs. Yeah. And um, they, it was really... We didn't know anything was going on. Right, right. It's, it's something that came out later, came to light. Mm -hmm. But, um, spoilers, we lived. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, oh. It's kind of cool. So, Nick Fury is, has the only um, radiation suit, so he goes in to try to turn off the nuclear reactor in the plane that's about to blow up. And he gets hit, hit on the head with a oh, uh, with a steel beam. Mm -hmm. Why would they use steel beams in an airplane? Oh, air? we'll <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> but yeah. So, a couple of pages of him trying to get to it and trying to move this lever and all that stuff. And the plane's and, uh, on fire and junk. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> here's the odd part. There is a, um, okay. it's like is like a mobile fallout shelter in the plane. <laughs> It's in the yeah. It's wouldn't all, you it's just turn? Truck. Wouldn't you just turn the cockpit into that? Yeah. So anyway. So everyone gets in there except Dum Dum says, "I'm not gonna die. Uh, I'm not gonna live without Nick Fury." Which Even is Fury a die. little gay. I mean, like, I mean, I grit they were friends and they were war buddies, but like, I'm not gonna die without my friend mm -hmm. or whatever. Or wait, he's not gonna let. He's not gonna go and save himself without Nick. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's a loyalty thing. Okay, okay. Right. And um, so then Nick Fury comes out and taps him on the shoulder. And, <laughs> um, oh, Dum Dum thinks he's dead. Thinks All he's right. Dying. All right, so here comes the egg again. And, and it's just a it. weird flying silver egg. Yeah, it's that's just it. bizarre. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a white. Uh, I think it could be white, but there's definitely a shimmer off of it, like mm -hmm. we're getting that... 
Uh, it sounds stupid, but it's kind of neat, Okino. Yeah. And they mess up Fury's flying car. Does he have his flying car yet? No. No, this is the flying car. Is it? Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. This ain't no blame kitty car we're sitting in. Oh, that's right. Fury says. He uh, punch, puts a hole into it and... Uh, in, the, in the egg. In the egg. And the egg has a flamethrower and it shoots these rockets at... Uh, um, that had these little, I went that these balls that come and make and it makes a roadblock. Okay. Oh yeah. So, um. and this is here's the funny part. What is this called? It's um, um, he gets he has air. They call them air sacks, okay. but it's air bags. Right. Back in the day. Right. I noticed that too. I'm like again another predictor of. You know, something that would be a real thing. Yeah. Um, they said that the um, airlines are already experimenting with them. So there was the airlines was trying to experiment with them first. That's interesting. I guess I'm taking this on, on his face value. He's talking. Right. To, and, you know, Kirby probably was, uh, you know, looking, reading recent, you know, like he's probably rent Scientific American and, and like got an idea. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great idea, uh, you know, wheelhouse for ideas uh, to draw from. Mm -hmm. Not wheelhouse, but you know what I mean. Source. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the car flips over, but they're okay because the air sucks. Yeah. Pretty nifty. Yeah. And then they blow the crap out of the egg. Right. All right, so we have this last little story at the end. Yeah, a little piece. And it introduces Jasper, the super annoying Jasper Sitwell. I who like Jasper. Fresh from the S.H.I.E.L.D. Academy. Yeah. And he's, he's the... He's kind of a Jimmy Olsen for Shield. He's really over the top. Like he's a nerd, but he's like really by the book and like quite capable as a Shield agent. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I just have weird reservations about this character. I'm like, um, I think everybody likes him, but as annoyed with him at the same time. It's kind of a cool little dichotomy. So. So um, one thing about Jasper Sitwell, you definitely have an opinion about him. Yeah, and he, I don't know, he's brave and he tries his best. Yeah. And a lot of times I mean, people don't take him serious because he's a nerd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, That's pretty cool, huh? We've got one more for, um, oh, do we? for oh, this episode. Oh, do we? Yeah. 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 Um, huh? From Charlton Comics. This will tide you over till uh, next week we get our, our next batch of Charlton books. But um, it's Beyond the Grave, number two. Um, and the lead story is called Die Laughing, uh, written by Gary Petrus, with art by Sano Kim. And Sano Kim's Korean. Can't you tell by looking at his art? I'll be darn. Hmm. There's something about it that just looks like uh, he's drawing Caucasian people through this oriental lens. Oh my god. I didn't see that, but I, it, it is definitely there. Yeah. Interesting. Um... He's not my favorite artist, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, uh, an unfunny circus clown. Yeah. Is there any other kind? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know about you, but I went from being afraid of clowns to being bored of clowns. I never, there was no sweet spot of being, oh, clown funny. No. <laughs> right, right. I, yeah, I'm not I, really a clown guy. I don't know if anybody is. Those are the very first clowns were kind of scary too. Sure. I read a history of them and they're just the first famous clowns are really mean, nasty people. <laughs> so, sure. Um now when people rent a clown, yeah. they don't come as a clown, they come as a regular person, then they put on their makeup. So the kids don't get scared. Right. That's kinda cool though. So that's a good way to do it. I mean, but mm -hmm. you think clowns are like as dead as vaudeville, you mm -hmm. know? They're pre vaudevillian, yeah. I would mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Um, this is uh, separate from rodeo clowns, which are cool. <laughs> right, because, because they might get horns in the butt, yeah, and they're actually kind of funny too. Yeah. So, but um, because it's more slapsticky, they're like, "Oh, a dangerous animal's chasing me around." Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so waka yeah. waka waka. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was amused by it, although I was in basic training to see one. Sure. And uh, I don't know. Here's one of the jokes. The only one I remember is that. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, there you got the ringmaster out there, and here comes the clowns. Call the police! Call the FBI! I says, what's wrong? Two women are fighting over me. He says, oh, what's wrong with that? Says, the ugly one's winning. <laughs> <laughs> and the ringmaster from the Circus of Crime. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> <laughs> like, and your wallet went missing, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that'd be kind of a cool idea to do a, do a circus. Although, circus is for kids and all that, but why don't you do evil ringmaster yeah. crime thing? I mean, we won't be stealing from people, but you'll have that vibe of everybody right. being evil. Well, you know, Isn't there's a, interesting? in a, a summer or two from now, there's supposed to be this Marvel Universe live tour show, okay? And it's like, you know, they have the characters and they have some story and it's an arena tour. Mm -hmm. But the... The ringmaster in the circus of crime would be perfect for that kind of setting. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be real snarky. Here's another hero. He's a zero to me. You know. Yeah. Uh, that'd be wonderful. I mean, having the show open up with the circus of crime getting their butts kicked by Spider-Man and Daredevil. Oh, that'd be cool. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Wow. Or yeah. remember that was one of the best stories we've read. Yeah. I just love it. I mean, Spidey and Daredevil. <laughs> Yeah, so, I, I love when they get together. I, I don't want them together all the time, but when they get together, it's kind of cool. I, so and many, oddly enough, there yeah, I don't think there's a trade paperback that's like there should be one. They're like the best of Spidey and Daredevil because they have like those like mm. they have great team ups. Yeah, actually, I enjoy when DC and Marvel get together too. Well, yeah, I mean those are real hit or but miss, but the earliest I, uh, handful of ones they did were really I great. Know, I enjoy them all. Some are better than others. But I don't know. I read this Batman and Daredevil one that was could have been good, but the art was horrible. Oh, hmm. but um, but it was in yeah, the '90s, uh, so what do you expect? Yeah, there's two things, and then this is going on a tangent. You got a comic book that has very good drawings, great stories, blah. Or you got a comic book that's got a really great story, but the drawings blah. Then you got the ones that are great story, great drawings, which is great. But I don't but know what I. But I mean, in the '90s, I remember reading a lot of ones like, "Wow, crap art, crap story." No, yeah. but I don't. I for me, I think the story trumps the art. I love the art, and it's great. But if it's got a good story, that will make up for bad art. Um, Good art kind of makes it for a good story, but not as much, or I don't know. Yeah, I mean, a, definitely a mediocre story can be saved by great art, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Right. Um, but I don't know. I, You know, it's there are good comics and there are bad comics. Yep. And, uh, um, and we talk about them all. About, let's go, let's go. Okay. Speaking of bad comics, oh, I don't know. Is this bad? Hmm. It's okay. That's okay. It's Charlton, and it's usually just okay. Yeah. It's, it is weirdly drawn, so that is kind of... So, this clown is not making people laugh, and he's really mad about it. And his boss says, don't make him laugh this, ne this next night, you're getting fired. But all he can do is be a clown. So, so this little girl, he's... Okay, the clown's looking really sad. And sulking. A sad clown. <laughs> and this little girl says, hey, now do something funny. So, he sprays her in, in, um, with the... With the with flower. The flower. With water, yeah. yeah. Is it a carnation? Is it a Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't like that. She's mad. And he says, oh, come now. It's, laugh is funny. And then he kills her. <laughs> yeah, like, ooh, he's definitely snapped. And he kills a child, too. Yeah, a little, cute little girl. Yeah. And all she wanted was to make her laugh. And she she liked clowns, so. Yeah. She was one in a million. <laughs> like, right? So then a couple of kids come and... Um... One thing, though, I think that Sano Kim may have mm -hmm. misinterpreted the script as a young girl. We would say a young girl, oh, some beautiful young girl, you know. Oh. And he'd probably interpret it as a little girl. And so we get a little girl getting killed by a clown, which is super creepy. And like... No, this is a horror comic. Well, I know. Hmm. But I, I don't know. These are just things that I kind of mentally noted as I was reading. Huh. So be right? it's possible. I mean, wow. we'd have to ask <laughs> Sano Kim. Yeah. You know, but. So he kills some other people. Uh, some, um, let's see. So he, he kills someone uh, and, some, uh, and a couple of kids again. Yeah. And then he kills these, this couple. Um, it's, and this is all between shows. Yeah. He goes on to his act the next night. And this is. 
This will get him, it never fails. And he's riding a little bitty bicycle, which is not, and with big floppy feet, which is not funny. And he falls, and why aren't they laughing? Why don't you laugh? You people, laugh, laugh. And he gets fired, and he starts shooting people. And then people start laughing. The victims that he killed laugh until eternity. So Yeah, so he's gone insane, like, already, but mm -hmm. then they, I don't know, it's kind of weird. Yeah, well, it's kind of cool that people... I mean, as it's not as a good cool, but it's in the comic. It's kind of neat how they have the ghosts of the people who were are like they're like swirling around him and laughing and mocking him. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, now the clown gets it in the end. So it's I guess it's a happy ending. <laughs> so uh, first of several backup stories is called Mister Moody's Amazing Hats. Um, no credit on the writer, but uh, art by Jack Sparling, who I know you like. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, so this fat, goofy guy likes hats. So he puts on a hat, and he becomes that character. In his mind. Right. So He's he, kind of nuts. He wears uh, the Mongol hat one worn by Genghis Khan, which is probably worth more than the all of the dollars. tea in China. Right. Yeah. And he, go, and he gets on a horse, and... Raves a saber. It should be a scimitar. Right, right. <laughs> right. And he, and he, I guess he's super rich because he has a butler and a maid, and they're really worried about him. Right. So then he takes. Because if he really goes off the deep end, they're out of work. I guess so. No, I, <laughs> he I goes to the nut house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anyway. But I think they're really concerned for him. I think they are too. So then he puts on. Um, Da Vinci's hat, <laughs> which and is like Da Vinci wears a beret, right? Of course, and of course, you just have his hat. You know, like that was you could get that, but uh, anyway, he does. Yeah. Then he wears um, a hat by uh, a Raffles, which was a famous well, back in the forties and fifties. This English um, cat burglar is really clever and all that stuff. The books are really fun. It's okay. Really cool. What is it called? It's called, his name is Raffles. Oh, okay. So, and he becomes, and, and Raffles steals diamonds and all that stuff, and so... So does Mr. Got, Moody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now they're worried that he's going to um, get caught. So yeah. they take the, apparently they're going to uh, take the, the diamonds back. Right. The so, maiden butler. Yeah. But then uh, Mr. Moody puts on another hat. It's a magician's hat. Uh, Houdini's. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he wore Houdini wore a top hat. I, I don't think he did either. Top hat started because I don't. Hmm. Top hats is an at least an eighteen hundreds thing. Yeah, so, I mean top hats for magicians. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. So then he disappears, and the end. Yeah, <laughs> so, he just poof disappears. So, yeah, weird. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next story we have is uh, oh, this is great though. This is probably the highlight of the issue, and actually probably nothing. It is. It's called A Grave Mistake, written by Joe Gill, with art by Steve Ditko. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, who's the name of the guy who's a narrator? He's I think it's a... Mr. M.T. Graves or something like that. Yeah. Let me take a I look. I never see his name mentioned. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I think okay. that's right. All right. This general sold out his troops uh, and sent him to certain death. A lot of generals do that for free. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, although, wouldn't it be just cheaper just to surrender them? Hey, we surrender. And that has happened, too. Uh, right. Um, in history. Um, we don't know where it's at. It's probably some middle European country. Right. Uh, um, it's left vague on purpose. Yeah, and it's very vague because he is, at the very first page, he's visited by a ghost of one of his soldiers. And he looks like it's... Early 19th century, but this looks the comic looks like it's happening in the 1940s or 50s. I mean, this could be. I mean, I got the impression that this is like referencing the uh, First World War or the Crimean War. Um, Something you know of that era, of that time period. The Crimean was in the 1850s. So oh, was it? Oh, okay, not quite that far back, but yeah. but pro I'm I'm guessing World War One. Yeah. But I could be also wrong. So yeah, yeah. It, it, they look actually they do the uniforms of Crimean. The people running around here look um, 1940s, 30s. Right. So yeah. it's 
So it's yeah, it's vague and whatever. Yeah, and it's a vague story. <laughs> so they see this ghost and um, he and accuses the general of selling out, and then everybody, I don't know, it's cool with it. They they forget about the ghost, but there's people looking in to see if this guy is um, on the up and up or not. Yeah, and he just got married mm-hmm. to this beautiful babe. Yeah. And you know he's wanting to. What's his plan? He's got some scheme to like. He's gonna die. <laughs> so he's gonna fake his death. <laughs> no, he's gonna literally die. And then you know, at, 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 for forty-eight hours or something like that, and then he, they're gonna dig him up. He's, he's got, got these a, two cohorts. One's a doctor, and one is a, what a grave digger. I don't know what he does. He's just a goofball. Yeah. The thing, um, but if they. He's got it so if he dies, those two guys go to jail. Because he's got dirt on them that will mm-hmm. come to light like as part of his will or something. So they really, really want to keep him alive. Right. And so, they're going to get money from him, too, mm-hmm, for yeah. pulling off this scheme. Right. Because he's he's faking his death to take the heat off of him from the selling out the soldiers. Mm-hmm. I think just run. I don't know. That's okay. Yeah. So his beautiful bride is crying. She right. looks fetching in black, though. Yeah. So the ghost comes back, and he's really mad about it. So I guess he fixes him. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, okay. The general paid the guys off. They're looking at their money, and then the money's counterfeit. Yeah, and they figure it out. So they want to double-cross him back. By stealing, getting him to save with all the money. And they find out it's all counterfeit. So the enemy, I don't know what the story is. Either the general has took the money somewhere else, the real money, or he was paid in counterfeit money. Yeah. So I don't know, and we don't know. Yeah. The ghost is laughing about it, though. Yeah, and both these guys get busted for their prior criminal uh, stuff, yeah. and the general dies. Yeah, the general comes back as a ghost. Well, he tells him, he comes out in ghost form, and he's dying. So they had this um, air vents and all that, and it was clogged with mud, and so he suffocated. Right. And so now the ghost is at the grave, making sure he never um, gets up again. So, right. So odd story. Well, yeah. Drama, pretty cool. Yeah. So we have uh, the last story in this issue um, is just a one-page filler, and it's called Bats, written by... Excuse me, Mike Pulowski, with art by Steve Stiles. Hmm. And yeah, um, this guy is arrested by police for being a vampire. He's taken back to his wife. His wife's really mad because he keeps thinking he's a vampire when he knows that the only vampire is her, and she kills the um, cop. Yeah. <laughs> the end. Well, what do you expect for a page? For a one-page story, it kind of works. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it has all the story beats of a story. I mean, that could have been fleshed out into something that had a real shocking twist, but it's all crammed into one page. Mm-hmm. But it's okay. I mean, it's well drawn and it's, you know, mm-hmm. okay. okay. So that's um, that's all for this episode. Um, Remember, kids, don't yield back shield. Hail Hydra! <laughs> <laughs>